Yes, uh, it is a pleasure to see and meet all of you virtually. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, deferrables. Um, and if you don't know those are, you should know by the end of the talk. Um, but let me first off uh, give a bit more of a background about myself. Um, so I'm Andrew Gobbin. As mentioned, I'm a principal engineer and astronomer. Um, a lot of my day-to-day -day work is on airflow and things around airflow, of course. Um, I actually was the primary author of the feature map talked to you about, deferrable operators in airflow itself. Um, so that's one of the, you know, I, I started writing airflow about a year and a bit ago and working on the project. So that was kind of my first big contribution. Um, and behind that, I've been doing Python for somehow 15 years and I've done a lot of work with Django and stuff in the meantime. So I've been doing Python a long time, a bit more, a bit newer to airflow, but uh, already a fan of the community and uh, all the things we can do to make it better. Um, I'm coming to you from the beautiful city of Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm not sure we can quite get a meet up uh, for Ever Summit here next year, uh, but I do encourage you all to come visit. It is lovely uh, most of the year. So let's talk about deferrables. Uh, the talk is kind of in three parts. Um, the first bit, I'm going to tell you about what deferrables are, why they exist, kind of the hole they fill in uh, Airflow's model of execution. Um, then we'll go into a bit more of a technical dive of how they actually work and how you can both write operators that work with them and also just the underlying mechanism so you understand it better and can work with it, either as you know someone working on Airflow itself, someone deploying Airflow, or even a DAG author. Um, and then finally, at the end, we'll talk a bit more about like what the groundwork we've laid means for Airflow and some of the things we can sort of go on and do with it in the future. So let's kick off initially with, uh, well, you know, what is deferring? Why does it exist? And for this, uh, it's important to think about how Airflow runs tasks. So by default, when you run a task as part of a DAG in Airflow, um, pretty much you, the DAG run sets itself up and then a task instance is created that says, hey, you need to run this task with these parameters. Um, the scheduler notices that, it picks it up, it marks it as queued and sends it to the executor. And then it's the executor's job to take that task and just run it till it finishes. When it finishes, it hands it back off little piece of the scheduler runs at the end to make sure there's a little bit of extra stuff that happens. But basically, most of what happens is the executor handles running the actual logic. So say if you've got, you know, a bash operator, it's going to go and run a bash command, for example. If you've got a Postgres operator, it's going to go and talk to Postgres and do all that stuff. Now, when you look inside what's happening in the ex execution, obviously there's a set of different things you can do in Airflow tasks. One kind of task is the one you see here. You fetch some data, you then do some big number crunching on the data. Let's say you run some NumPy or some SciPy or extract some features or something, and then you save the data back. Now, in this scenario, we're using all that time we have on the executor really well. We're pegging the CPU, we're making good use of the resources. In general, it's a pretty good use and we're not really wasting anything. But there are other kinds of tasks too, and a lot of these look like this. Um, let's say you're submitting a job off to a different cluster or a different system. You might have an operator that submits the job and then just waits for the result to come back. It could wait for a couple of minutes or even a couple of hours, but it's waiting to confirm that job has happened somewhere else. And when it comes back, it then logs that as task success in the database and then exits. And notably, what's important about this is that's kind of wasted time in that big gap where Airflow is waiting you've take, basically taken up this whole thread of execution doing nothing. All you're doing is waiting on an external system. There's no CPU usage. There's no real disk usage or basically memory usage. And of course, this diagram is kind of misleading because sure, if it takes like a second to submit a job, three seconds to wait for it, like the ratios here suggest, it's not too bad. But in reality, it's more like this. Like I've seen jobs that take hours or even sometimes it's days to execute. And you are literally tying up a huge amount of time on your executor just doing nothing. And this is kind of an example of opportunity cost. The idea that like in both of the main executors in uh, Airflow, so in Celery, there is a slot system. If you are running a task, even if it's idling, it is using up a slot. And by default, the Celery worker in Airflow runs 16 slots. So if you run 16 of these idling, waiting for something else tasks, you use up a whole worker that's not actually doing anything. You're wasting money having that machine just sit there and idle. On Kubernetes, it's similar. Obviously, Kubernetes, instead, you are reserving memory and disk and CPU. 
But those reservations also take up space in the Kubernetes cluster. You're kind of wasting all these resources. You reserve them for something you're not actually using. And this is a scenario where, you know, we kind of came in and looked at it and went, we need something else that, that does this job more efficiently. And this is where deferrables and what we call triggers come in. So if you take that picture I showed you and you kind of think about it, what if we take that middle section, the section that just sits there idling for an external event, and we give that to a different system that is more efficient at running that stuff? And that's what asynchronous or deferrable operators are. We have this new thing called the triggerer, and the triggerer is specifically designed to run things in high parallel that are mostly idle and pack thousands of them into a single process. And so what we do is we have operators run on the executor for things that are high CPU or need local data, and then they offload themselves to the triggerer for pieces that are, let's say, idling or waiting for an event. And that's kind of where the balance happens. One of the key ways this works is the triggerer, that new piece of airflow, if you think about the architecture of it, um, is written with asynchronous Python. This is kind of the way we can run thousands of things at once, is that rather than having you know, a thread per operator or a process per operator, um, we can just have thousands and thousands of triggers, which is a new kind of thing we'll talk about later, um, in one big event loop. And as long as they're all mostly idling, they will happily coexist and just sit there using up a single CPU core in a single slot or reservation in your system. And so kind of what that ends up doing to the way your task workers, for example, use, like if you think about like, let's say you're running Celery and you wanted to run a worker, one process on that worker might just be running one task and, you know, idling most of the time and eventually it'll get back and then finish and then run task two. By, off, by offloading a lot of that idle part of the, the middle part of the tasks, um, you can interleave a lot more of the time on those executors and then use them more efficiently, only using them for things that actually require their extra resources and more separation. We'll get into how all of this works technically in a, in a second, and you'll kind of get a better understanding of how it works and what's going on under the hood there. Um, but one thing I want to highlight is the trade off here, right? So we have inserted a trade-off by like, well, it's not free to take a company running task, suspend it, persist it, switch to a different thing called the trigger and start it again. That does take time. And in general, what we've seen in our testing is the longer your idle time would be, the better the saving you have. So as long as it's over 10 or 20 seconds, already your switch out and back is worth it. But if you, for example, have an average of a 10 minute wait, um, for that idle section. Let's say like all of your things are take this job, submit to an external cluster, job takes 10 minutes, job comes back. Um, if that's your average time is 10 minutes, you will see a 90% reduction in resource usage because all of that giant middle section is no longer being done. You don't need to provision workers for that anymore. And of course, the further you go down the line, you go to hours and hours, you get to like the high 90% on, on how, how well that works. So that's kind of the, the trade-off here. No, no architectural change is free, but I think there's a lot of cases where this makes sense. So let's talk about how it works on a technical level here. So when I mentioned you hand off, um, the way it actually works is right now, when you run things inside Airflow, you're generally running an operator, right? A task is usually an instance of an operator, or it might be a task flow -like function, but we'll talk about operators here for, as an example. Operators in Airflow are very flexible. It's kind of just like Airflow says, give me a Python thing, I'll run it and do whatever it says. Um, we couldn't quite do that for triggers, as I'll talk about in a second. So there's now a second class of things. You have operators and you have triggers. And what triggers are is a new specialized class of workload that is designed to run on the triggerer. Um, and crucially, it has a lot more restrictions. The idea here being the more restrictions we place on a thing you can run, the more we know about running it and the more efficiently we can run it. So with an operator, it could do literally anything, right? We have, we have no way of knowing whether we can suspend it or trade it off or cram more memory in there. Um, whereas triggers, we have a series of restrictions. In fact, the ones on screen are the main ones. So first of all, as I mentioned, it must be written asynchronously. Um, that is our main restriction. And that's the reason we can run thousands of these per core, basically, is by, by saying, 
if you use asynchronous Python, like that kind of come, that ecosystem is built around Python that waits for things externally. It's very good at that. Um, the second thing is that there is no persistent state. So with a trigger, you can't actually store anything locally. All you get is when you start a trigger, you can send it a little bit of information and that bit of information is stored and given to it each time it's turned on. But the idea is we don't allow any state on the trigger itself because what we want here is much more reliability and flexibility. And so we reserve the right to take a trigger, shut it down and move it to a different machine whenever we want to inside Airflow. Um, the trade-off you get and how to deal with is no state. The benefit of that is that it's incredibly high, highly reliable. Like we basically just sit there and like, if a trigger dies, we can just restart all the triggers on a different machine and bump them off somewhere. And there's literally no break in service. In fact, if your tasks are deferred to a trigger, they will survive a full cluster um, takedown and restart because they are that persistent and that reliable that in that state, they're incredibly resilient. Um, they're much more resilient than running tasks, in fact. So one of the other advantages here is if you are in a deferred state, deferring to a trigger, then your task is much more resilient in that phase and won't suddenly die if the machine is running on dies. Finally, the other restriction is it must be able to have multiple copies of itself. Um, this is mostly because of, so we built the whole thing in kind of a failure first mode. We made sure that like it could handle all the failures. There's an edge case during a network partition where a machine can be running triggers, its heartbeat fails, and so the cluster thinks it's died and starts new triggers, but actually they're both alive. For that reason, it has to be able to support multiple copies of itself. Um, all of these and more are documented in the Airflow documentation with a bit more information and, and restrictions. So if you want to write some of your own operators and triggers, um, you can go and look a lot more of this up there and see a bit more deep analysis of what's going on here and why we do it. But let's walk through some actual code here briefly and show you how it works. Um, so on screen here is an is example of a very simple trigger. Um, this is a trigger that merely waits for a specific moment in time. Um, there's a trigger like this actually that ships with Airflow now. Um, it's a bit more well written than this. This is a very simplified version, but basically a trigger takes some initial data. So in this case, it's a moment and then it fires itself when that event happens. That's kind of the contract of a trigger, right? So for example, you might say, oh, I have a trigger that fires when a file turns up in S3. I have a trigger that fires when an external job finishes. In this case, this trigger fires when the certain date time moment is reached. Um, and the key contract of a trigger, there's three things to implement. The init, where basically you get given some arguments. It's pretty standard Python stuff. There is a serialized function. This is used so we can take a trigger turn it into a database row and bring it back again. And the idea is that serialize literally just calls in it. So you can see those two kind of reflect each other here. And finally, the meat of it is the run. Run, as you see here, is an async def. It is a coroutine function. And all that does is it has to simply yield a trigger event when it fires. So you can see here, um, it merely has a infinite while loop that waits forever until uh, our moment is in the present or the past, which is when the while loop fails its condition. And then once that happens, it then yields. And crucially, you can see here, there is an await inside that while loop. And then you write asynchronous code, await is the thing you're looking for. Whenever I say await, it suspends my coroutine and goes off and runs something else efficiently. And then Python knows to come back to me in about, in about a second to revive me. And that's kind of the way that we can have all this stuff run and coexist. Of course, a trigger is not useful without a way of calling it. So in an operator, what you tend to do is you call this new self.defer method. So in an operator, basically, uh, if you want to defer yourself and say, hey, unload me from my worker and let something else run, you have to defer, hence the title of the talk, deferrables. And basically what you do is you call self.defer and you give it two things, you give it the trigger to defer to. So you're saying like, when this trigger fires, bring me back. That's kind of the thing. And you can give it any trigger class there. We serialize it. And then you want to give it what to come back to. Um, so if you want to, you can give it the execute method again. But the pattern I generally recommend and the one you'll see in our documentation is that when you come back from a deferral, you come back to a different method. So you know you're in like phase two of your execution. And so you see here, um, this one is going to come back to an execute complete method. 
So if you were, say, doing an actual like job-based operator, you could do some cleanup or some logging here and that kind of thing. So that's kind of the very simplistic way of writing operators and triggers. Again, there's lots of docs on these. I would love you if you go read them. If you find holes in the docs, do let us know. We can, we can add those in as well. Um, of course, we didn't just write the basic framework for this. There are actual implementations of these. Um, Airflow Core itself has a whole suite of uh, date, time, and, and that kind of triggers built in as part of the initial push. And then at Astronomer, um, we have our own providers package that then adds a whole bunch of other ones for common data stores or databases. Um, so for example, there's an S3 uh, sensor in there that, as I mentioned, efficiently waits for a file to appear, for example. Um, so there are plenty of pre-existing implementations already, and we're already seeing a couple of the um, commercial providers also put this functionality into their own providers as well. So I kind of hope here is that over time, a lot of key airflow operators will just come with this where it makes sense. Of course, let's talk about where it makes sense because this is, again, a system of trade-offs. Not everything can be written like this. Obviously, as I said up front, if something is like CPU bound, or just doing loads of processing, it doesn't make sense to defer it. There's nothing you're waiting for there. So the first thing is it must be a thing that you can wait for. That's the key design feature. But the second thing is it must have a portable identifier. So for example, an SSH operator can't be deferred because we can't take an open socket and then hand it off to a different machine. That's not possible. So whatever you're doing must have, so let's say you submit something to a cluster and get an ID back and you can query with that ID, that's fine. We can send that ID to a different machine, that machine can run the query and it's fine. But if you've got an open socket that must persist, that generally can't be deferred. And so for example, um, the current Postgres operator um, relies on an open socket and so we can't actually make it defer very easily. We have some ideas how to change it, but that's kind of the overall framing of like, it must be an external event that happens and it must have a portable ID or data. We can have any machine work out whether it's true or false, basically. That's kind of the restrictions that it comes with. So that's kind of the overview of the system. Again, um, it's not super in depth, but there is great docs on this. I encourage you to read them. I do want to spend a few minutes here though, talking about like, what is next, right? Because like, you don't just come up with this and turn it into Airflow and go, right, that's it. We've got one asynchronous thing and we're done. Um, this is kind of meant to be the foundation of a further set of work inside Airflow and there's more to do. So first of all, obviously, as I mentioned, right, we kind of want to have more and more operators support deferring. Basically, if, if an operator sits there and waits for something that is portable ID-wise, there's not really a reason it shouldn't defer itself unless it knows it's less than a second or two to wait. Um, and so generally, we kind of want to just have this kind of become part of the ecosystem more generally and just be more of an assumed thing. But there's more. So triggers as a concept are deliberately separate from operators. And one of the reasons is they're kind of just this idea of here is a piece of code that tells you when an event happens. Obviously resuming an operator is one use of that event, but launching a DAG is a different use of an event too. And so when we built the system, we kind of always built it with the assumption triggers will be used for more. And the next thing would be triggers launching DAGs. So for example, run this DAG whenever a file turns up in this S3 bucket could be one of those uses. Um, this is starting to progress. Uh, we're looking at some of this with our data handling AIPs and proposals and kind of mix into that. But in general, the idea here is that we can move from DAGs being merely launched on the schedule to being launched on a whole set of things that are triggers and that kind of build off this same system. So like, like you know, that date time trigger I showed you um, could be used to launch a DAG. Why you do that, I don't know, it would say it's scheduling it. Um, but like the idea is that any trigger could be used for multiple purposes and thus could be shared code between I want to run this DAG on this trigger and I want to defer the operator on this trigger as well. There is also more generally the idea that like the triggerer and triggers that currently exist, they're almost kind of too specific. One of the reasons they're written like they are is they are the first piece of asynchronous code in Airflow. But there's a lot of call for other things that could be asynchronous. You can imagine, for example, a full on operator that was written in this fashion and didn't need to be. And so, and this is very early days yet, but one of the things I think we're gonna start looking at is, is it possible to more generally have asynchronous workloads and turn what currently is the trigger, triggerer 
into more of a general like there is synchronous execution and there is asynchronous execution and airflow can kind of handle both and run them on the same system obviously that's a very big ask there's a lot of thinking to do potentially in that area um, but it would be nice to be able to run other parts of airflow as workloads on an asynchronous worker system you can imagine cases where like parts of airflow itself wait on other parts of airflow or other systems so that was one example where um i would love to look at like as we sort of build more things with triggers look at more generally asynchronous stuff in airflow and what we can do with it and then of course that extends into airflow's core itself right there are parts of airflow that as pieces of software just sit there and do processing and idling on events um rewriting those is a very big ask and might happen soon um, but there are many pieces of airflow itself we could consider the web server being a very prime example um, that could be made more asynchronous and more efficient um, in the next year or so so that's kind of the the future looking piece of that plenty of options we can do there and lots of thoughts um, if you do have ideas about what we can do with this or where we can put it or what you'd like to see please do get in touch um, obviously airflow is a huge open source project right like people like you and me work on it um, we have a lot of open source contributors and some paid ones as well, of course. Um, but I would love to hear from everyone about how we can do this and many other things with asynchronous work and just generally how we can improve Airflow's execution. So with that, hopefully you've learned a bit about deferrables and triggers and uh, thank you very much.